Welcome to my Master of Neurolithotope series, and today we're getting into Egypt. So if you missed my other locations, they'll be in the description below, but I am going to walk through what I've learned from running this campaign. Now I'm not going to go into every single detail, but I'm gonna hit on the key points and top tips for running this chapter. Now this is going to be chock full of spoilers, so if you do want a spoiler free overview of the campaign, there will be a video linked in the description below as well. Egypt is pretty flexible about where it might end up in your campaign. Some people go immediately after England, but my players ended up going to Egypt second to last. So it's really variable based on how your players decide the priorities of the clues that they're getting. It mostly takes place in Cairo, Egypt, but there are pyramid explorations that will take you outside of the city. The unique setting here gives the chapter a memorable feel, and there's a lot of cool places to explore like the pyramids and the streets of Cairo. There's also a range of encounters and experiences that your investigators may or may not get themselves into while they are here. Egypt is a medium length chapter taking my players about 15 hours of play or three to five sessions. I also rank Egypt about mid-tier in terms of enjoyment for the overall campaign. Now I'm gonna get into the possible reasons you may play this chapter or you may decide to skip it. The first point I see going in either bucket depending on how your group likes to play games. So Egypt is a little bit more structured versus the other chapters in that there is a specific goal that the cult is working towards, which is resurrecting Queen Natakris. This is something that's happening here and now that your investigators can affect. That's why I say that it might be a pro that you would wanna play this because it does add a little bit more clarity and structure in a bite-sized piece that your investigators can go after. But I also see that it could go on the reasons to skip because the structure is a little bit of a different feel from the openness of the other chapters. And at times could feel fetch questy because you're going after these different elements that will allow the cult to raise Queen Natakris. The other reason you may want to play the chapter is the setting is really fun and unique. I loved that this campaign gives you a chance to experience different cultures and the history in these locations. So Egypt is one of those that I felt I was able to bring to life pretty easily and cause a overall enjoyment at the table. And of course you may want to play this if you are a completionist and know that you want to experience the whole entire depth of what Masks has to offer. Adding to the reasons why you may skip this chapter is it's not essential to the core campaign. So the Queen Natakris is a cool story to experience, but it's not a part of the main storyline. So if you wanted to skip it, you could. Also in going through Egypt and the clues that your players would find there, there's no real major clues that would be missed if your players didn't end up visiting this location. So all that to say is if you are playing a condensed version of Masks, Egypt is a chapter that you might consider skipping. Moving to the setting callouts. Something about Egypt is it may be the first time that your players are in a completely foreign environment. So the language and the culture will be different and possible hurdles if they reach this location. What I found unique here is that there's a ton of dichotomy in Egypt. So we're talking about the temperatures ranging from extreme hot to extreme cold and the variances in the lifestyle of people living in Cairo. So you have the really super rich and you have a lot of beggars and poor people and people performing on the streets. So there's a lot of different elements that you can bring and showing the deep contrast between elements like social class and the environment. And I'm always a fan of adding mechanics to the environment. So the book calls out dehydration and heat stroke as possible elements that you can bring to your game, which I felt really added to the atmosphere and was a benefit to using. The cult here is the Brotherhood of the Black Pharaoh, which was also located in England, but this is the main hub for this brotherhood. This is an extremely large cult and most of it is made up of Egyptian nationals. What made this cult unique is that their rituals took place in the desert. So this is an awesome environment and fun element to play with, 
but it also means that in Cairo, the police are actually pretty well aware of the cult, but they pretend like they're not. So the cult doesn't do a lot of activity within the actual city because they don't want to disrupt the religious activities that are happening and they don't want to get in trouble with the police because they all kind of know that the cult exists. Moving to the key NPCs, where I give you tips on how to play and what personality quirks to bring out in each of them. The first is Warren Bassart, and he was Carlisle's former agent. Now the thing about Warren is he actually witnessed some sphinx activity and weirdness going on when the expedition was taking place. So he is extremely mentally scarred and overall defeated. He had a terrible experience and a lot of trauma from working with the Carlisle expedition, so now he spends most of his days just high on hash. I spend time on Warren because I would really encourage your players to meet with him and find a way to give the clues so that they make their way to talking with him. Warren provides a lot of depth to the Carlisle expedition story and I felt like it added more explanation and a better idea of the experiences that the expedition had. So keepers, make sure that you read through Warren's story and that you're pretty familiar with it so that you can stay in character while you're explaining what actually happened out in the desert. Quick side story from my campaign, one of the investigators in Egypt was a medical doctor and his focus was on the new surgery called lobotomy. In case you weren't aware, lobotomy actually won the Nobel Prize in 1949 and it was used pretty widely in the 1930s and 40s. In this storyline, my investigator was a little bit ahead of the curve, bringing some experimentation to the surgery in the mid-1920s. I bring that up because there were a couple times throughout where the doctor offered to help people with their mental ailments. In this case, Warren was extremely traumatized from his time working with the Carlisle expedition. So my investigator offered this new fabulous cure of a lobotomy to help him find peace. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit strange and a fun experience to have this investigator bring this to life for everyone. Next is Dr. Henry Clive, who is on an expedition that was financed by the Penhew Foundation in England, and he also is a cultist. So your players may or may not be on to Clive and what was going on during the expedition. Since Clive is the leader of this expedition, he had a special in to find the mummy of Natakris in the pyramids that they were excavating, and they arranged for this mummy to be stolen. So your players may or may not be on to Clive in that he was actually the one who orchestrated the mummy being stolen, but either way, it doesn't matter too much if your investigators understand what's going on. I felt that Clive was pretty flexible as well in terms of personality, so really think about what would be most fun for you to play during this part of the Egypt campaign. Next, we have Omar al-Shakti, who is the high priest of the Brotherhood. And he is like the top of the top, right? We have the two people over in England, Gavigan and Shafik, who are the priests and high priestess. And basically, El Shakti is their boss. And of course, it's awesome because he always has his cat with him, which, you know, is just fun. And he is a very high and powerful sorcerer. So my biggest tip for you is to not expend all of his power on the investigators and play him more as a reserved cult leader. Because after all, he's been resurrected many, many times. I really enjoyed that Al Shakti loves being a human. So even if your investigators do kill him, it's most likely that he's gonna get resurrected again anyway. So don't put too much stress on trying to bring his full power into a fight if they do end up getting in some sort of altercation. And finally, we have Sharifa Rawash, AKA Queen Natakris. My player successfully thwarted the resurrection of Queen Natakris, so they didn't get a chance to interact with her. 
But you'll see that there's a lot of different places in the other chapters that mention if she is resurrected, she can be used in different ways throughout the campaign. So just pay attention to those little tidbits throughout and she's pretty flexible on how you would like to insert her. She could potentially become an ally or just cause a lot of trouble for your players. And one of the fun parts about her is that she is very new to this modern society because she's been dead for a long time. So depending on when your players would encounter her, you might want to play with that unknown and a little bit of confusion, but trying her best to learn and fit in. Key locations for Egypt. First, we have the shops of Faraz Najjar, and he is full of leads for Egypt. So he has a lot of different areas and clues, general gossip that can get your players in the different directions for this chapter. It's also a good chance to bring the setting to life a little bit. So there's probably a lot of chaos going on in the streets of Cairo and these shop owners trying to sell to the investigators and different things they might be selling. So this was a cool chance to really bring to life the streets and the setting that they're in. The next location is the Mosque of Ibn Tulin, and this is where the girdle of Natakris is being guarded. So these are the good guys that have actually stolen it from the cult and are protecting this artifact so that they can't resurrect the queen. But your players and my players might not know that they are the good guys. So they eventually infiltrated this mosque, which is also a bit of a hospital. So you can imagine my lobotomist investigator had quite a grand old time while he was there. But the other half of the party was experiencing the depths below the mosque where they were holding and guarding this artifact. The challenge for your players is that there's five or six guards there at any time. They take their role very seriously to guard this. So it might end up in some bloodshed. There was also a bit of noise happening because they decided to try and get this girdle in the middle of the day. So while everything was happening with the chaos of the hospital upstairs, there was some persuade roles that had to take place to make sure that no one went down in the basement. And then later the next day, there was a newspaper article that I created because it happened to be the next session that they started. So just a tip that if there's a, something that happens within the campaign that you think is interesting to bring and change the setting, you might type up some sort of news article to make it specific to what your players have done. It really makes an impact and makes them experience all over a really fun session that they had before. And finally, we get to the pyramids, the core of this Egypt investigation. My top tip here is to take notes of all the different pyramids and where they're located and why they're important. Because for me as a keeper, it got a little bit confusing and it might be confusing for your players too. So make sure that you're not afraid to be pretty clear about each of these different pyramids and why they're important. I'm going to break the pyramids into four different sections. So first is the Giza Plateau, and this has three different pyramids. Giza is where the Clive expedition originally was taking place and where they stole the mummy of Queen Natakris from. Area two is Memphis, and this is where the Clive expedition moved to once the crime took place in section one. Now I did find this a little bit confusing. So a change that I made for my specific playthrough is I removed Memphis from it entirely and kept the Clive expedition in the first area of Giza, still doing their excavations there. That allowed a little bit of extra challenge for my players and how they were going to investigate these pyramids and what happened for the crime. I did have some investigators join the expedition. So that was a little bit of a fun element to play through and and a unique opportunity for them to get creative. But if you'd like to include Memphis, just make sure you're being very clear about the location and the differences of the other pyramids. And it's just going to be another location that your players will have to travel to. Either way, if you include Memphis or not, your players will likely end up in the tunnels of the pyramid at Giza. My players and I loved the tunnels of this pyramid. It came with a map, which I just adored completely. It made my life so much easier. And it also came with a chart of different encounters that might happen within the tunnels. So some tips as you're working through the tunnels. Number one is to possibly pre-plan a few more encounters than they actually have in the chart. 
I felt like we were really enjoying that section and I wanted to expand it a little bit more. And if I had pre-planned a few more encounters, that would have made the process go a little bit more smoothly. As they're going through the tunnel, make sure you print out a map of your own and write notes as to what encounters they had at the different stopping points so that if they retrace their steps back, they're going to have to encounter those same things. And a little bit of a warning, if you do use the children of the Sphinx, it might end up in a player death. This is where one of my investigators did meet their end. So making sure that you're being aware of the strength of these children of the Sphinx. The third segment is Medum, and this is where Warren actually experienced the rising of the Sphinx. So your players may want to go there, but there's not a lot of clues there, and there shouldn't be a ton of time spent in that area. And the fourth element of these pyramids take place in Dashor, where there are two pyramids, one of which has a destroyed ward, and the other is the throne of Narlithotep. This is an opportunity where your players may encounter Narlithotep in his pharaoh-like form. I did include this in my campaign and I thought it worked really well. Be very mindful of Narlithotep's power because of course if he wanted to just crush the investigators he could, but that doesn't make for a very fun experience. So instead, Narlithotep is more there to mess with the humans because he really finds enjoyment from that. Overall, I went the route of asking my investigators what their heart most desires and trying to get them to convert to the cult. If they did convert, then they were removed from the game and they had to make a new investigator. But if investigators decided they didn't want to join the cult, that was perfectly fine because Narlothotep would just send his hunting horrors after them. Egypt does have one side track scenario and check out my blog post at Prospera House where I go more in depth of these different side track adventures. But the black cat in Egypt was probably the least impactful of all of them in the campaign. It was nevertheless still fun and I enjoyed the imagery of different cats following Van Hevelin through the city of Cairo and subjecting my players to that same fate. So how do you know when it's time to leave Egypt? Well, this one's pretty easy because there's not anything super essential to the core campaign in this chapter. As long as they've gotten a little bit more depth into the Carlisle Expedition story, you're good to go and can move on to different locations for the core campaign. I hope my tips for Egypt were helpful and that you're having a blast playing through this epic campaign. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.